evening, everyone, as folks start to come in. Um, good evening and welcome to Civics 101, Why Should I Care About Incomplete the Census? Our first virtual cocktail hour slash happy hour um, and really great dis discussion on the census. Uh, we're excited to have all of our participants with us today. We're excited uh, to have our audience with us today and we'll get it started in a few minutes, in a couple of minutes. I'll give some people some time to get in. And for our audience members who are in right now, if you would like to invite any friends, if you have friends that are interested in seeing this presentation, in the chat box, you will see the information to register for this webinar. Also, we are on Facebook Live. Let them know if they have Facebook and they would like to see this, um, that they can jump on Facebook Live to watch this as well. Um, they just won't be able to ask us questions through Facebook Live, but any questions that you may have, you can ask us through this area of the webinar and give us one more minute and then we're gonna get started. Great, all right, welcome to Civics 101. Uh, on behalf of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights and our Campaign for Equal Dignity, we would like to thank you so much for being with us this evening. Uh, we're really excited to introduce a specialty cocktail to you all and also introduce this really amazing panel that we have for you all tonight um, as we discuss why we care about and complete the census. Um, I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Tara Gay. Uh, Tara is the Principal Consultant for Change and Transformation Consulting. Tara has created training mod models and modules to provide trainings for uh, communities throughout the United States, excuse me. Tara's trainings have resulted in enhanced learning experiences, preparation, knowledge, cultural awareness, community engagement, and development skills for her audience. She has trained youth, staff, and community members around the country via partnerships with the Under 26 National, City Foundation, the Corporation for National and Community Service, Habitat for Humanity, City Year, Kaboom, the Magic Johnson Foundation, the Shaka Foundation, Target, Bank of America, Starbucks, Price Waterhouse Cooper, JetBlue, Office Depot, the Learning Channel, TLC, the King Center, Equitable Dinners, Out of Hand Theater, and many, many more. Thank you so much for being with us today, Tara. I'm really looking forward to having you moderate. Oop, still muted. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. Now I feel like the commercial. <laughs> Thank you so much and everyone for being here. And I promise I haven't even started with my cocktail yet. So <laughs> you're in for a great time this evening. Thank you so much for having me. I also have the pleasure of having some phenomenal guests that are going to help us with tonight's conversation around the census. Um, Aixa Paxqua uh, is the Managing Director of Advocacy, Advocacy Civic Engagement, Community outreach, outreach, and Arts and Culture for the Latin American Association. She actually began her work with LAA and has been there since 2012, leading the organization's communications, public relations, and their media relations efforts for the last five years before she transitioned into their, her advocacy work with them in 2017. Her advocacy role um, has completed an education policy with Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education, and she has developed cultural engagement initiatives, has held an affordable housing effort in Norcross, and has worked with the city of Brookhaven um, for the refugee service agencies and the Cross Keys Sustainable Neighborhood Initiative, among other advocacy and community engagement initiatives. As a former journalist, Aixa has worked for Business Week, Time, People Magazine, as well as for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and Puerto Rico's El Nuevo Dia. She is the president of the Princeton Club of Georgia. So welcome so much, Ms. Pasquale, for being with us this evening. Looking forward to a great conversation with you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, yes, we also have with us tonight, um, um, Ed Reed is also with us and he is the program director for Fair Count. Ed is from Virginia and with over a decade of experience in state and federal politics, nonprofit organizations and state government, 
And now, Ed, currently as the program director at Fair Count in Incorporated based here in Atlanta, Georgia, he is the person who is the staff liaison for the Black Men Count Initiative. He cultivates relationships between Fair Count and community-based partners and supervises the faith and technology and field programs. Ed has also served as chief of staff in, in the Virginia Lieutenant Governor's Office, where he also managed the successful transition of administrations. He became the first African-American Virginia's history to serve in that role. Previously, he served as legislative staff in the Virginia House of Delegates and the Senate of Virginia, respectively. He has also served in numerous capacities in higher education, including as an adjunct faculty member at John Tyler Community College, College and as an admissions counselor at Hampton University. So Ed, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to all of the great things you will contribute tonight to this conversation as well. And last but certainly not least, our final um, panelist tonight will be Ann, Anna Miller. And she is the co-chair of the Governor's Complete Count Committee. Um, as the Director of Planning and Research Evaluation and Communications at the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, she is in this role and is as in this role, pardon me, uh, in this role, she is responsible for strategic plan planning, performance management, legislative tracking, census initiatives, occupational regulations, and communications. In 2017, she was appointed to be the co-chair of the Governor's Complete Count Commu Committee. Prior to coming to OPB in April 2017, Anna spent two and a half years at the Georgia Lottery Corporation. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from Georgia State University. She and her husband By Byron um, also have welcomed their son Henry in January of this year and reside in Mableton, Georgia. So Anna, thank you so much for being here and please to all of you all, this is not something I normally do. I'm normally the person who's receiving the bio being read. So I apologize for any errors in your bios being recited this evening, but we certainly know you all will make phenomenal guests this evening. So thank you all so much for being here. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tara. And as I mentioned, this is our first virtual happy hour slash uh, cocktail in conversation. So we had a specialty cocktail made for the night. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump into a video of uh, our bartender, Josh Grubb, who bartends at the Highland Inn Ballroom down in uh, the Virginia Highlands in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and he made a specialty cocktail just for us and just for this evening. So we're going to jump into that video. All right, so I'm just making a little summertime cocktail. Um, it's gonna be gin. I'm gonna have some uh, cucumber, fresh basil, uh, lemon juice, uh, and a little sugar. Uh, first things first, take a mixing glass because I'm gonna need to muddle a few ingredients. So what I'm doing is three wedges of cucumber. Depending on the size of the leaves, you know, really just maybe like one to two basil leaves, but nothing crazy. Just gonna muddle this. Um, muddle without sugar, and if you're using sugar or like a syrup, it's better to do the stuff syrup after. Uh, but if you're using a little sugar, you don't need much. I'm doing this, uh, putting this in a rocks glass. quarters of an ounce of simple syrup right there three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice and then one and a half ounces of gin I'm a fan of Hendrix that is that we're just gonna add some ice to shake it up bits of uh, basil and maybe the cucumber you want to float around so I'm doing a double strain
nice little cucumber to throw inside. Wow, that looks absolutely delicious. Um, and so I certainly wish he was here for me to be able to enjoy that lovely drink. But I hope that if you all are joining us, whatever your beverage of choice is, whether it's water, whether you've been able to enjoy making the cocktail along with our bartender, we certainly hope that you are here and going to have a great time with us this evening. I will ask that our panel will rejoin us now so that we can jump right in and begin our conversation. I know that for so many people, you probably have seen and maybe even felt like you've been inundated with commercials about filling out the census 2020, how important and value that's going to be. Um, and so tonight we hope to be able to certainly answer any questions that you may have had about why is it important? Um, what are the, the, you know, the choices that get made as a result of census being completed by people in your communities? What are some of the things that you may have heard that may not be absolutely correct? And, and what are other ways that you might want to consider, you know, how that information is safe and, and um, how it is utilized so that it does actually make a difference in our community. So I will just jump right in with our panelists and ask, and anyone can certainly begin the conversation. But first and foremost, why is the census important? I mean, we see the commercials and they tell us that it helps with making decisions and policies and things like that. But how, how does that really um, resonate with people when they actually fill out 10 questions? How do those 10 questions really do all of that? All right, so I'll, I'll, I'm happy to start. So every person, every time they step outside of their house or even in their house, is touched by some program that the census, census data affects. So from roads to potential housing projects to school lunches, there are more than 55 federal programs that are based off of census data and many other uses from state uses to local uses, even through representation from all the way up to congressional districts, all the way down to school districts. So it touches you in every aspect of your life. Thank you. So yeah, uh, echoing Anna's um, statement, um, the, the, the census is really about uh, power. It's about economic power and about political power. Uh, as Anna mentioned, you know, there's uh, hundreds of billions of dollars from the federal government that are uh, allocated every year to the states and local communities. And those, uh, how much each state or community gets is determined by, by census figures. Uh, we have programs in Georgia that's about $24 billion a year in those 55 federal programs that Anna mentioned, which include Medicaid, Medicare Part B, Pell Grants, SNAP, WIC, uh, vouchers for housing. So it's a lot of federal programs. Uh, school lunches mm -hmm. and school breakfasts are also part of the federal uh, funds that we receive based on census numbers. So, uh, so there's a lot of stake economically for our communities in terms of, you know, of the census and what the numbers say. Uh, also in terms of political power, everything, you know, all levels of political power are, are determined uh, using census numbers from local school boards to city to counties to state legislatures to the, con you know, to Congress, the, number, uh, the numbers uh, gathered from the census determine who gets political power in this country. Um, uh, there's only 435 seats in the US Congress and that number stays fixed. So uh, every, you know, every 10 years after these counts, uh, that number is divided among states and the states that have gained population are gonna gain uh, numbers of, uh, of representatives and states that lose population are gonna lose numbers. And last, uh, in the last decennial census in 2010, Georgia gained actually one uh, representative. So we have 14 representatives from, uh, from Georgia in Congress. Um, and also, if you know, uh, representatives uh, also, the number of representatives also determines uh, the, the electoral votes. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, we're, you know, census numbers are really used to define how many electoral votes for president each state has too. So it's, it's a lot, there's a lot at stake uh, politically and economically on the census. Thank you so much. 
I just want to add one thing, and of course, Anna and I actually did one for job there, kind of explaining um, you know, what the, the census is. And one of the ways we, we often don't think about in terms of um, how the census impacts our communities is through the uh, process of economic uh, development. Um, and so when businesses are looking to you know, whether they want to locate a, build up a business or they want to relocate to a certain area, they're looking at that census data um, to drive their decision. For instance, if you Google uh, any city or county and you're looking for, you know, the demographics and population trends, you're going to say the 2010 census said this about that city or that county. And so um, they're looking at, at that and, and enabling that to, to drive their decision. And so it's really important that cities, counties, towns have a fair and accurate a depiction of what their population is so that they're not um, you know, they're not leaving monies on the table. They're not, businesses are not going elsewhere. And one of the, the, the last things I'll say about that is, you know, the, the federal money um, that Anna and I actually talked about, you know, the, the billions of dollars that exist there through all of the federal programs. You know, when we think about paying taxes back to the federal government, um, that's really our money that we're talking about coming back into our communities. And this is money that we deserve and we, just, you know, should have in our communities. So it's really important that we are being counted so that we get our fair share of the pie um, for our communities, for the, the resources um, that we so desperately need. And so and to that point, then, can you kind of talk, take our audience to the, the, the journey of the census, if you would? So I fill this out. And then how then is it actually going to be utilized to determine those resources? Um, and how do they actually use that data? And certainly anyone else can certainly jump in as well. But just to your point in terms of resources, how does that happen when we look at the disparities that currently exist? Is that because people did not complete census before, or how might it change the scenario of things that are happening in communities based on them completing it now? Yeah, very good question. And so, you know, the census is only done every 10 years. And so that, that information is then tabulated, um, you know, at the federal level. And of course, the, your privacy is of utmost important, particularly in these days. And so the information is, your personal identifier from information is not used to tabulate, you know, those responses. And when it gets over to these federal agencies, then, you know, they know how many people exist in these areas. So they're able to provide resources. We think about education and we think about school divisions and their ability to be able to build new schools and infrastructure based on census data. When children are often some of the most undercounted populations that, that exist. Um, and so it's hard to get a real clear depiction of how many children exist in a community if we don't have that uh, information through the census. And so well, those agencies at the federal level then are able to figure out, you know, the, I guess the, probably the simplest uh, example is the Federal CARES Act that we just saw through the stimulus package and a lot of the funding has come down as a result of uh, the global pandemic. You know, CDC, FEMA, uh, all of those agencies, they're looking at census data to drive where they need to send resources. Um, you know, where, how much money does Small Business Administration, you know, allocate to this area versus this area. Um, and so it, it, we don't really think about the census in that mass plan. We think about somebody coming knocking on our door, but we don't think about the, the power that, it, that exists there. And then, of course, through the process of uh, reapportionment, which is what I actually talked about, the 435 seats, um, you know, in Congress and using that data to reapportion uh, that and, and then through the process of redrawing the lines through redistricting, which will, of course, take place next year at the state legislature. But there, you know, those are just some of the ways that that information is then used from that 10 question questionnaire and then translated over into real money and real services. One of the things that the Census Bureau, a lot of their folks will often say that is the money doesn't necessarily follow the need. The money follows the numbers. And so if this community has, you know, they've been counted, the money is going there and versus where maybe it could have a greater need. And so that's why it's really important that we show up and account. Thank you. And I have one question because he did re raise the issue around privacy. And I know for many people, especially now, privacy becomes really an issue when you find larger companies and corporations have been breached within people's information going out. Can you talk to people about what is the level of assurance that they can have when they're completing the census that somehow it won't be an identifier for who they are or some way that they will actually be individually tracked through the information right. that they complete? That's a great question. And it's I'm really glad you brought up. So the way that the census data, once it goes into the big pot, we'll say, of all the census responses, 
the way that they do redistricting on a very high level is they just say, put all of the um, total population into one pot and they divide it by 435. And then that's the size of the congressional district. So each Anna Miller, 28 in Cobb County and all my other information is not going to be together at that level. And beyond that, and part of my role, I work as the state liaison to the Census Bureau, so I touch a lot of census data sets and every census data set that I touch, I have to attest that I'm not going to use it improperly or even share it with some of my coworkers. If they look at my screen, I could be liable for $250,000 fine and five years in prison each for each violation. So the census workers are not going to be sharing your data. It is not worth jail time and $250,000 fine to share it. But beyond that, people ask me, you talk about Ancestry.com and how do they find that my great grandma was mm -hmm. in Portland or wherever. Well, they, public law was created probably around, um, I want to say the early 1900s that is called the 72 year rule. And they called it 72 because that was the um, suspected lifespan during that time, 72 years. And so census data that is collected in 2020 is not going to be shared publicly identifiable. So my census form, and I know Atlanta Council has been doing great things about showing um, census forms, mm -hmm. but that's only able to be released 72 years after the census data is collected. So just to put it in perspective, my census form will be publicly available in 2092. So you think about your individual forms, it's, it's not going to be released. And I know people have asked me um, about apartment complexes. Well, mm -hmm. I don't want to be honest that I have six people living in my apartment that I've told my landlord that only four people should be living here. I don't want to my landlord to find out. And it's really important that people are honest in how, how many people are actually living in their house mm -hmm. because your landlord is not going to find out that data. They cannot get it from the Census Bureau. It's more important that all of the children who live in your household are counted because we think about the 10 years in the life of a child, that's 10 years of school experience or school years where they really need the lunch or the classroom seat or the pre-K seat or any of the other funding that goes along with that. So what we like to tell people is how many people in your house are flushing the toilet in that area? Because that is how many people are using the resources in that area. So it's really important that they be counted where you're living and to not worry about the data being given because to be honest, dealing with the Census Bureau can be very difficult to get information out of them. So I can promise you it is a locked box of information. And so once the information is collected, identifiable data will not be released mm -hmm. until 2092. Yes, uh, to, yeah, the data, as Anna and Ed said, is aggregated, you know, in mm -hmm. 72 years, you know, you cannot release any information that will identify the person or the household. But, uh, you know, also, you know, there's very uh, strict uh, confidentiality and privacy mm -hmm. uh, protections for, you know, for the use of, of this, uh, of this data. Um, and the Census Bureau, which is part of the Department of Commerce, cannot share this data with law enforcement for law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you know there may be some fears in our communities. Oh, they're going to give my uh, my information to the immigration agencies, and I'm going to be deported. And you know, they cannot share this information with the president or with any other agencies, law enforcement or any other agencies for that matter. So, and there's very strict protections, you know, for for this data. That's what we try to we are we assure our, our community that uh, the data is protected. Aisa, thank you for that. And because it also brings me to another question I had around dispelling maybe some of the concerns or myths or misinformation that people may have heard around undocumented uh, communities and what whether or not they will count or whether or not they should be filling out the census. What are some of the other things that you can clarify for people in any community, but specifically when we're talking about some of this recent information that has gone out to probably confuse people and perhaps even pr pr play some level of fear on whether or not people actually do count um, when it comes to the census. So in the decennial census, that one every 10 years, 
every single person who lives in this country is counted. It's the most exhaustive form of data gathering by the US government, and it's every 10 years. The census does other kinds of surveys, the American Community Survey, now they're doing a household survey, a poll survey from, you know, from the COVID-19. But the decennial census, we're talking about the one done every 10 years to uh, determine the seats in Congress uh, and to determine the federal uh, dollars that we get. That is done every 10 years. And every single person who lives and breathes in the US is counted. And the census is very, very clear about that. Not every citizen, not every person with legal status, not every person who was born here, every single person who lives in the United States as, as of April 1st, 2020, has to be counted in the census. That's something that we're trying to let everybody know. Uh, earlier on, there was this uh, discussion about, you know, is there going to be a citizenship question in, mm -hmm. in the census or not? So, you know, that was, you know, creating fear among our communities because they didn't, they didn't want to answer that question. Then the Supreme Court decided that last year that that was not going to be included. But the census includes every single person who lives here uh you know from you know the youngest of the of the young to the you know to people in you know octogenarians and people you know in their later years in life it includes everybody your immigration status does not matter and everybody counts in the sense so nobody should be fearing about you know wondering you know do i count i you know i, I don't speak english i don't i don't have a u.s passport i don't have citizenship i wasn't born here you know that shouldn't matter everybody counts in the census and that's one of the messages that we've been trying to tell you know we, we've sort of emphasized three messages in our in our campaign is that everybody counts you know we know a lot of our households are multi-generational so everybody in the house who lives here not just your family but everybody who lives in that house counts we also emphasize the message about schools you know a lot of people come here from other countries for a better life. Uh, so schools are very, very important. And, you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of federal resources uh, for schools uh, that are distributed uh, based on census numbers. And uh, third, the other message that we mentioned, the other messaging that we used was about uh, the confidentiality and privacy, because those are really issues in our community. So, um, yes. Thank you. So, Thank yeah. you for that. And yeah, I but think everybody counts. Nobody should be fearful. I know that this week uh, the president issued a memo mm -hmm. uh, about who who constitutes a whole person, and it's it's really not the president's job to determine who gets counted in the census or who is a whole person. You know, he's trying to create fear and confusion more than anything because what he was saying is mostly for the allotment of the congressional seats, not just for the census count itself. He was saying that congressional seats, when they're allocated, they shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be counting undocumented immigrants in, in that count. But uh, people may have been thinking, oh, that's, you know, I shouldn't reply to the census, but, you know, it has nothing to do with the census count, what he's proposing, and it's going to be challenged in court. And, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, House of Representatives is going to, you know, challenge that too, that, uh, because we think it's unconstitutional and unprecedented what he's trying to do and not right. Uh, but uh, that, you know, the fact that the president says something like that just creates more confusion mm -hmm. in our community. It's one more thing that we have to clear up in this cacophony of messages that we're getting. You know, there's the protests, there's the COVID, there's the economy, there's the election coming up. It's one more thing that we have to, to clarify for our populations. Thank you so much for that clarification. And you also bring me to uh, another consideration for us because COVID-19 is still here. And it is in many places uh, re-emerging in ways and surging in ways that really people may not find that the census is their priority. Many people are finding other things, but how and would any of you all, and any of you all certainly are welcome to join in this uh, answering this question, how do we then say to people, one, the level of ease it is to complete it so that it is not something that perhaps people have put to the side because they thought it was time consuming or that it would be something that they really had to spend more time thinking about. Um, but can you just talk to people about why it is still important if they have not done it yet and have been kind of just really inundated with everything that is COVID-19 and all the other things now, schools going back and all these other things that really con convolute the mind really of what people should prioritize. Why is this still important to be a priority for people? Right, so that's really twofold. The first being the census every 10 years, the decennial census dates back to 1790 and it is the largest mobilization of the federal government in non-war time. And the census 
is going to try and count everybody who lives in this country. And particularly in now with COVID times, mm -hmm. on August 11th, enumerators are going to start going out to households that haven't responded and they'll knock on your doors somewhere between five and six times, not every single day, but between five and six times to try to get a response because there are so many federal dollars at stake here. And so by going online and self-responding, you avoid having to have an, a person-on-person -person interaction with somebody. They are going to be observing all sorts of social distancing, wearing masks and all of that, but it does allow you to respond without having to have a human-to-human -human interaction. The other side is Medicaid and dollars are based off of census counts. So we know now more than ever how important it is, how, how important healthcare is like, we didn't already know that, but making sure that everybody in your neighborhood, community, apartment complex, family is counted in this will help boost the actual numbers that Medicaid supports. So it's focusing on helping your community with the Medicaid federal funding side of it, but they're gonna be coming to your door to try to get you to respond anyway. And so by going online and self-responding, you can do it in the comfort of your own bubble in your own house and have the time to respond and make sure that you get everybody from grandma to the little six month old who's living in your house with you. Um, it, it just allows you to have a, do it a little more on your own time, but it is so important that you do it for those reasons. And Ed, can you talk to, because you talked about going online and I think that we still make a lot of assumptions about the level of whether it's literacy that is computer literacy, whether it is actual literacy of people, what are the efforts that are being made to address the needs of people for whom, one, they may not have the literacy skills to just read through the questions for themselves, or they may not have access to computers or um, the ability to actually know how to function on a computer to complete the census. What are the programs or the things that are out there that can support those folks in communities that may have those issues? And or how do they reach out to organizations to get support now instead of waiting until, as Anna was talking about, when people are going door to door if that's not their level of comfort? Yeah, no, a very good question. And sort of piggyback on what, what Anna mentioned, you know, we've seen that the online option is a very pop popular option that exists. And it's not one that existed prior to 2020, large part. Um, but it is a, a bar barrier and an obstacle for a lot of communities, particularly in Georgia, talk about uh, rural Georgia and South Georgia in those communities. Um, and what we've seen is that a lot of people don't realize you can actually call in to complete your census over the phone. So there are three ways that you can complete it before that census taker even has to come to your house. And so we want to really make sure we articulate that to folks that you can call in via 1-800 numbers, 844-330-2020. Again, 844-330-2020. Call in, do your census at any time with the operator over the line. And that could be a, a, a great way for some of our elderly population who may not feel comfortable doing it online or may not feel comfortable having someone come to their door, especially uh, during a global pandemic. Um, but we also just really know that the infrastructure does not e exist in a lot of communities in terms of technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so at Fair Count, last year we set to do a goal of 150 unique internet installations in, in parts of rural Georgia, but also in some of our rural, uh, urban communities as well who lacked access to, to the internet. And we provided them with a set of, of uh, Chromebooks um, or and or iPads and a mobile hotspot. And we did wired internet in some locations where permissible. But um, you know we've seen a large uptick in usage since March when the pandemic hit and there was a push to virtual learning. There was a push to just everything digital virtual. In fact, we're looking at ways now how we can expand that program. And you know, our initial thought when we, we when we started the program was to have people one apply for census jobs, uh, which we saw that they did overwhelmingly um, apply for those enumerated positions across the state of Georgia, but also to um, make sure that they were able to complete the census using these devices. Um, that sort of slowed down a bit when the pandemic hit because people weren't doing in-person events. Um, but we've worked with a lot of our installations to make sure that if they have the devices available, they're wiping them down in between people, they're having the appropriate PPE on site. And we had a location today who, you know, had several people use the devices. I was on the phone with them. They had several people, uh, you know, utilize them in, um, you know, very rural parts of Georgia, Clay County, Quitman County, Georgia. And, and so those are communities that we've really tried to focus our efforts on to ensure that, you know, they're counted. And you know, I know a lot of our 
listeners and audience tonight may be in the metro Atlanta region, but we surely know people in some of those rural areas, you know, pick up the phone and, and, and make sure that they are also um, completing, um, you know, the census. So the internet is a convenience to some, but, you know, I want to make sure that we also recognize that it is certainly a barrier and a hurdle for a lot of others. And I wanted to add, you know, on the one hand, the sense that COVID-19 pandemic is really shining a light on why the census is so important. You know, we're, we're seeing, as Ed mentioned, money from the CARES Act, how it's going to be uh, allocated to communities. But also we're seeing, you know, where are hospitals? Where do we need to build hospitals? Where do we need to, you know, you know, what are the you know, where do we need to access people? You know, if we need to reach out to this population, in what language should we reach out to them? You know, that's why the census data is so important. And this pandemic is illustrating why we need this data um, to, to be current and to be accurate. Uh, but also on the other hand, the COVID pandemic has been a big distraction from, uh, from the census. Uh, it's not just the pandemic, but it's the economic, you know, collapse is the protest, is everything seems to be a distraction from the census. And ironically, you know, the census was started to mail out invitations uh, in the mail in mid-March. And that's when the whole pandemic, you know, blew up in our faces in around, you know, the 15th of March. So the timing, you know, was, you know, perfect for, for eclipsing, you know, the message of the census in the sense that, you know, it, the whole census has been eclipsed all the time by, by the COVID pandemic mm -hmm. and the economic, um, uh, collapse. So, uh, so it's been very, very challenging to get the message out. You know, a lot of our, uh, of our messaging was going to be based, you know, doing face-to-face -face outreach to our communities, knocking on doors, you know, face-to-face -face with people. We've had to stop all that. We've had to rely a lot on uh, digital and social media. We've been doing food drives and giving information about the census in, in, um, in, in flyers and, and postcards. But uh, we need to have that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, if you see the response rate for the census, there's a self-response rate that the census keeps track daily. It's now at over just over 62%. In Georgia, that's a little bit lower. It's about 58%. But that number, I was reading a press release from the Census Bureau from two months ago, that number was just about 60%. And now we're two months later and we're in 62%. That number really has not grown that much in, you know, in the last two months. And I really think we, you know, there's only so much that we can do online and including flyers and mailers and things. I think we're going to need some more of that, you know, face-to-face uh, -face outreach and engagement with the community to get those numbers up. And so it's a struggle and it's a challenge because right now with the number of COVID cases going up, you know, we, you know, we can't be putting people at risk. So it really, it's a... Uh, it's been really uh, problematic for us to get the word out during the, the COVID crisis. Thank you. And just before I ask my next question, I definitely want to invite those who are um, joining us this evening as you're enjoying your cocktail. Uh, if you have questions, we certainly will want to make space for you all in just a few moments to be able to receive any questions that you all may have as well. But certainly hope that uh, what you're hearing so far is answering many of the questions you may have had as you came to tonight's discussion. But if there's anything that we have missed that is a, a really burning question that you have around the census, we do invite you all to join us uh, and put your questions in the chat box um, for us and then we will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can before we close this evening. Um, but I want to jump back in and ask Anna just really quickly, we talked a little bit about um, the census really uh, in, in many ways being the voice almost like your vote. But then we also know that you can be in trouble if you register more than once to vote. And, um, you know, and I think there was also some confusion for people for mail-in ballot, whether or not their mail-in ballot their application for it was their actual ballot. And so wanting to just clarify for people as well, is there any penalty if you did not realize someone else in your family had already completed the census and then you do the census as well? Like how does that happen? Or are there any things that people should be concerned about if they're not aware someone else in the family is completing the census? Right, so um, there's, so I'll use an example of the paper form and then the online form. Mm -hmm. The paper form is sent to your house and it has a specific address on it. So there's a, um, there's a data point they can use for like one, two, three Main Street, filled out their census and said there's six people in there. Um, so in, in that case, that, that record goes to the Census Bureau. And if I was like, oh, I don't know if my mom filled out the census for our house, let me go online and fill out the census. I'll type in one, two, three Main Street and I fill out my census. Well, 
depending on what time, when she had mailed that census form in, if I submit it and their the census bureau will ping and say, hmm, there's two records here for 123 Main Street, something's obviously wrong. Um, they'll contact one or the, both of you, one or the other of you, because one of the questions on the census is, how, is there a phone number to contact you? For situations such as that, they would call and say, two got submitted, and then they would just throw one out. There is no penalty for it. They would just do a check. And the other side is there are certain way, certain types of households that are counted through a different process. And to not get too technical, they're called group quarters. And those are things like college dorms, mm -hmm. um, nursing homes, things where everyone lives in the same place where there's one administrator, not apartments, but nursing homes, dorms, things like that, mm -hmm. um, military barracks. And so one of the questions on this, the last question on the census is, does this person live here or do they live somewhere else, like deployed overseas, student at dorm, think, and there's several different choices. So if my mom, if I'm 18 and um, go into Georgia State, my mom is in Athens, and she says, oh, Anna lives here, the last question, she'd be like, oh yeah, she's a student. That would remove me from being double counted. So there is a mechanism for them to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And they are, um, and then the administrative records from those facilities are sent to the Census Bureau. So if you live in a college dorm, you aren't responsible for being counted. So they do have mechanisms for trying to reduce double counting, but they're not going to come after you. If you live in a one bedroom apartment and say 75 people live there, you probably will get a call because they'll be like, don't know if 75 people can be living in this one bedroom, but they're, they're not going to come after you or press charges or if you accidentally submit an online form and your mom mails it in. They'll just call you to double check and see. And that what it, so what you're saying is it doesn't nullify the form. Mm -hmm. It just requires maybe greater clarification. It, on it, it would require follow-up. They would, they'll see that someone responded and they'll just try to make sure which of the two is correct and then they'll throw out the duplicate. Yeah. The census reconciles that information. Yes. Got yep. it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so to that point also, I know that there have been some news stories that talked about people who are already be coming around pretending to represent the census. And so what are some things that people might be able to have as identifiers of actual people who are working for the Census Bureau to do this? You talked about the date of August 11th. Mm -hmm. What are some things, or if someone has to call you, what are some things that people... Right should be prepared to ask for to demonstrate proof that you are actually a person who is employed to do this work, whether it is a phone call, is there a question they should ask? Mm -hmm. If someone comes to your door, is there something that they should ask to be able to make sure that they can identify that person? Right, yes. so they, the Census Bureau will always have their Bureau IDs and they will have that with them and most likely a bag that says Census 2020. So if anybody is ever concerned, there's a district office in Atlanta that they can call and um, ask is, are enumerators coming to my area at this time? Should they be expected? And they can tell you if they should or should not be out in that area during that time. And Aixa, I think you were gonna join in with that yeah, one. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 that I say, you know, enumerators, as Anna said, they start knocking on your doors on August 11th. The census has had to reschedule and reboot a lot of their, you know, operations because of the COVID-19 and one of the operations that on the ground operations from enumerators and census specialists mm -hmm. have had to be altered. Uh, but starting August 11 is when enumerators start knocking on your door. But if you don't want an enumerator to knock on your door, you can just answer the census and it will be okay. If you answer, you know, before 11th or even uh, the, the deadline for the completing the census, the self-response has been extended to October 31st from July 31st. We, so we have three extra months that we had initially. So if at any point during, you know, during those three months, you fill out the census online or, in, or by phone or in the form in the mail, you know, they're not, they're not going to knock on you. You can still self-respond over the next three months. That's still an option. So you don't have to wait for the enumerator if you have. And any advice to parents, because you say August 11th is when people might start coming around. For a number of school districts, we know here in Georgia at least, that means some children will be virtual, but parents are still actually working. Any advice to parents who are out there to make sure that their children are safe through this process, other than, of course, parents who tell their children simply don't open the door. However, anything that they should know for sure that enumerators would not do if they were just coming into contact with children? 
So an enumerator is never going to ask you for any kind of payment, any social security information, any bank information. They will not ask to come inside your house um, and they will always have identification. But the best way to keep people safe is to encourage self-response, whether it is mm -hmm. do the online form or calling into the bureau. I don't know if Ed or um, Aitza mentioned that when you call into the bureau, you have the option of 13 different language operators to answer. So there is a language barrier. They do have other languages. So the best way to prevent somebody from even coming to your house to knock on your door where your kiddos are there is go online and fill it out or call in and fill it out, self-respond. Thank you. Thank you for that. So if there's any family members who are out there watching with us this evening, that is something just for you all to make sure that you have as a, an additional information for your children to ensure their safety because the Census Bureau is all about maintaining one, your privacy and also ensuring your safety in the space that you dwell. Uh, and so we just wanna make sure that that is a message that you can also share with children because again, in this time, there are so many things that go along that unfortunately are not in the best interest of our communities and we just wanna make Make sure that our children are safe in this process as enumerators are really just out there trying to facilitate their jobs but at the same time making sure that you all as families are able to have those discussions with your children as well um, during this time so and i wanted to just move us a little bit along and ask um we we see your you're well branded there with fair count and wanted to understand what are some other things that people can anticipate related to your work and programs that you have related um connected to fair count yeah thank you so much for the question um you know we um, are a relatively new nonprofit launched last year, just really based on getting a fair and accurate count in Georgia. And we sort of expounded upon our, our work nationally with other states and other partners to ensure that we reach the same mission and goal. Um, you know, we have sort of a multifaceted approach at Fair Count. And I talked a little bit about some of the technology solutions and, and our program there. Uh, one of the other big uh, points of outreach has been through the faith community. Um, we know that faith outreach is one of the best ways to, to do outreach uh, around civic engagement, but took all its faith leaders are often trusted messengers and leaders in their communities. Um, you know, pre-COVID that looked different than it did now, but we still have been, um, you know, in, in engaging faith communities. For instance, we, in partnership with the Census Bureau, launched a weekend of action for a lot of our faith places of worship this week, starting today through Sunday. Um, we'll be, um, you know, mobilizing places of worship to to participate and engage um, in the um, in the census as well. And then, lastly, we have a group of organizers that we have on the ground, about a dozen organizers right now in different parts of the state um, that are working with uh, folks on the ground, um, uh, working remotely and, and virtually right now to ensure that we're still you know, working with complete count committees that are on the ground. Um, that we're working with community leaders to provide resources that, that they may need to continue to get this message out. The last thing I'll say is that we launched a, a virtual, well, excuse me, we launched an actual bus tour in March. Um, and after only making about six stops, we had scheduled about 75 stops on this tour. And we had to take the bus off the road due to the uh, pandemic. And IXA was so graciously, we were going to partner with the Latin American Association to bring up bus there to engage some of their constituents as well. Um, but we just came up with an idea, like, why don't we do this virtual a bus tour? And so we launched a virtual bus tour in June. Um, next week is actually our last week of that. By the end of this bus tour, by the end of next week, we'll have reached over um, 80, 000, uh, excuse me, 80 counties across the state of Georgia wow. through this virtual bus tour, through you know, um, teletown halls, through texting, through phone banking, through virtual events. Like I mentioned, we did two of virtual events today in Clay and Quitman County. So that's why I'm so browned, uh, branded up today is because this is the third event of the day. And so we've reached you know, hundreds of thousands of Georgia residents and households as a result of that virtual bus tour. And so um, you know, virtual outreach should not be you know, like toss to the side, you know, we, we're in this situation and we're certainly trying to make the best use of, of the time here um, because it really is, the census is really now I feel more important than ever um, when we think about everything that's going on. And I think I actually brought up a really good point. I mean, you got the protests that are going on, you got COVID-19 that's going on, everything else is going on, but there's really an intersection of the census there. And we talk about civic engagement 
uh, with the protests. You know, we've seen some people who decided to go to the protests to make sure that they are talking about the census or that they are trying to get people to complete the census at the protests. We, as, we certainly understand the connection between healthcare and COVID-19 and the census. So uh, Anna mentioned at the top of the, the hour that the census really, when you, you know, you're in your house or you leave your house, it really does impact everything. And, and that's, I like to say ditto to that because it, that certainly is true. Um, and then um, one other thing uh, is a Black Men Count initiative that we have that where we looking to engage Black men. Black men are one of the most undercounted population that exists. In fact, the Urban Institute um, suggested that in Georgia, there's roughly 67,000 Black men that could go undercounted this year. And that was pre-COVID-19. So we expect that those numbers to have trended up after COVID-19. And so we launched a complete count committee in Georgia working with black men from every corner of the state to come up with some creative and innovative ways to reach black men and we launched that initiative nationally and really been able to mobilize black men in a way and engage them in a way that had, they had not been before um, around the census we found that there were so many people who believed the census was something that it in fact was not or that there were so many myths out there about it and so we're just continuing to dispel a lot of those myths as as we continue the outreach thank you so much Aisa, and for you with the Latin American Association, how have you all been able to use the census as a way to continue or extend the advocacy work that you all do or any specific programs that you all have that you'd like to share with our audience that may be of value to them to learn about or perhaps even participate in? Yes, yeah, so you know, as Latinos and other minorities tend to be undercounted uh, in the census historically, and this year, you know, I'm afraid it's going to be more so because of what we discussed here. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the list of, of populations that are undercounted, Latinos check a lot of boxes. They tend to be renters or they move frequently. Um, they tend to uh, have large families, a lot of children, you know, a lot of children under five are mm -hmm. undercounted and Latinos have very young families uh, and a lot of children. So, you know, we risk being undercounted on that front. Uh, people who don't speak English, uh, who may not know the system or what's going around there, people who are recent immigrants, uh, people who want to stay in the shadows because they're undocumented or for other reasons. So when you look at the categories of of populations that are undercounted, the Latinos check a lot of boxes there. So, you know, in, in the best of circumstances, we're undercounted. So now, you know, in this uh, climate, you know, it, it's more of a risk to be undercounted. You know, we've been doing a lot of uh, social media. Uh, we've been participating with Fair Account. They, they did do the virtual tour uh, and they kicked out of Dalton with our office up there. You know, Dalton has over 50% Latino population uh, in the corporate capital of the world. So uh, Fair Account kicked off their virtual tour uh, with our office up there in Dalton. So we've been trying to do, you know, Facebook lives about the census. We've been trying to do social media. Uh, posts. Uh, we've been doing a lot of food drives during this time and that has provided an opportunity for us to give them uh, flyers. The census, uh, we have not been able to have census representatives at these drives because they're not, census has not allowed its, its staff to, to be, you know, to be doing in-person outreach. So tomorrow, for example, we have a, a huge food and school supplies drive at Plaza Fiesta. We're expecting over a thousand families and uh, we're including a, a message on the census, you know, um, in each of the of the food boxes. So I wish, you know, there was a possibility of maybe having volunteers or census personnel be there in person and asking people, engaging in a conversation with them and asking them, you know, have you filled the census? Yes or no? If you have, fine. But if you haven't, you know, here's my laptop, you know, you can fill it out here. You don't need to know your code from your, from the letter. If you just type in your address, we can, you know, we can help you fill it out. So we wish it could be that face-to-face, in-person interaction so that we can get more census forms to that. And as Ed mentioned earlier, you know, technology has really been a barrier for our population. Uh, now that we've been in this pandemic, a lot of our services have been remote. Uh, things like filling out applications for financial assistance for rent, which has been a huge, uh, the number one problem, I think, in our community, they have a huge uh, demand for financial assistance for rent. That's a process that in our office, face-to-face -face will take about 30 to 45 minutes. And now, you know, they have to do it over the phone and the computer, taking photographs of your documents, e-signing and all that. And it's a process that can take now several days. And we know that our population, you know, does not feel very well versed in, in technology, using technology day to day for things like, like filling out applications and stuff. So we know that uh, we need to do more face-to-face -face interaction and, 
and uh, and guide them uh, and explain to them. So, you know, there's only so much you can do with online and digital. And we think that, you know, where there's a huge need for face-to-face -face interaction at this point. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Anna, um, two questions for you, actually. One, before you answer, like, what will you be moving forward to and, and working on as it relates to the census, especially as we gear up for August 11th and moving forward with things like that? Just one quick question for people that I wanted to ask. When can people anticipate that they will begin to see the effects of the census taking place? So we talk about it right. being done every 10 years. When right. do they anticipate there actually being the effect of their census data? Right, that's a great question. And because of COVID, a lot of things have changed in this decade for the first time. So um, I had mentioned October 31st being the deadline being extended for self-response. Mm -hmm. So by pushing the deadline back three, three to four months, it has pushed everything else back. So the first thing that will happen with the 2020 census data is going to be the reapportionment at the federal level. So the federal, the state legislature is going to get the data sets and they will um, start, well, they'll reapportion at the federal level and then the state will get them at the local level. So probably in 2021 and the beginning of 2022, we will have new congressional seats from these new census data. And we will also start seeing the effects of the um, data points at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. And that, those will be the data points that we will base all of federal population-based funding streams off of until 2032. Wow. So, and then in um, terms of what you have next, any particular things in terms of programming areas or anything yeah. like that that the, the audience should know about that is important for them to know related to the census work you're doing? Right, so um, we have started a big ad campaign um, and targeting around the April date, but when everything happened, we stopped everything that we were doing and kicked it out. And so obviously the message has changed now. So we um, actually starting on Monday are gonna have a uh, new ad campaign that's going to go on all of the media networks in the state digitally on um, Hispanic uh, radio and TV um, as well as um, Atlanta radio and TV um, really in partnership with Georgia Family Connection and Georgia's Vo Georgia Voices for, Voices for Georgia's Children. Sorry, it's late on a Friday. <laughs> um, and what they did is they went around and interviewed real Georgians in real situations talking about how the census is important um, for them and why they need to fill it out. Ed has mentioned um, African-American males being one of the um, largest continually undercounted groups. And so we have several pastors from different areas across the state um, in those videos, just explaining why they're important, why this is important, why they need to participate. So um, we're really doing that push the first couple of weeks of August and trying to give a last, hey, fill it out. I know a lot's been going on, but people are going to start coming around August 11th. So now is the opportunity to kind of get out and get it done before people start coming to your house. So we're really starting our kind of our second round of um, a media and digital push. And one final question I do see that did come in for us is that someone said that they tried to complete the census online and got a, an error code. Um, what should they do about that if they have had trouble with being able to access it online? Um, I would contact the Atlanta um, District Census Bureau office and let them know, um, or, or you could also um, call the 1-800 number, 1-800-330-2020, um, um, and you could just fill out the phone, sorry, fill out the census with them there, or if you wanted to do it online, um, you could call that number and it's, they could probably walk you through whatever um, issues you were having. That'd probably be the best way. Thank you. Uh, and then they wanted to know about identifying as a person of cover, color, even if um, there's not personal identifying mm -hmm. information for state and federal administrators uh, are prone to racial shenanigans is their term. And so just wanted to, again, be able to clarify that we have about a minute left. So and before um, anyone takes on that question, I just want to thank all of you all for being with us tonight. We had a 
great amount of conversation and great information that we hope was helpful for everyone. We certainly hope people have enjoyed this happy hour with us. We have certainly been happy to be here with you all. Um, even if we didn't partake in libations, we certainly uh, thank you all for being here with us this evening. I will ask Ed, maybe if you can answer that question really quickly in regards to that, and then I'll invite Jasmine if she will come back in because we do have some future programming things that we want to share with people before we head out this evening. So just quickly, a person had the question about whether or not identifying uh, their racial identification is important or um, for them completing the census. Yeah, no, very good. So the, I think Census Bureau does, a, I think, a, a really good job and they've gotten better at, at providing options on allowing people to identify how they feel they identify. Um, and we feel that, you know, it is really important for, for folks to, to, you know, complete that section of the questionnaire with how they identify. You know, when we, the, some of these programs that um, we talked about that are federally funded, that stem monies down from the census, you know, they're looking at population trends, they're looking to see who lives where, and that does have a real, you know, that does have an impact through federal dollars and funding and even through political representation in terms of how we redraw and, and reapportion the seats. And so really we encourage people to, you know, put that information there. Don't skip those questions. Don't leave that information off, but complete it. Thank you so much. And again, thank you so much to all of our panelists tonight. Jasmine, take it away. Thank you so much, everyone. Awesome. I would just like to echo Tara. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for being with us. Anna, Ixa, Ed, thank you so much for all of the knowledge that you brought to this panel today. Tara, thank you so much for moderating such a great discussion. Um, for our audience, thank you so much for coming to our Civics 101 first happy hour. We'd like to say thank you to our bartender, Josh Grubb. Again, he's been a bartender for 12 years. Uh, he is at the Highland Inn. You can find him at the Highland Inn um, and at the Barber Tinder on Instagram. Again, uh, I keep going. There we go. That's cool. Um, again, thank you to our panelists. If you are interested to, in following them, there's some information on following our panelists here um, at, at faircount.org, Ixa at a pascal at the laa.org and anna.miller at opb.georgia.gov. And for our upcoming program, if you have not signed in to join our campaign yet, we, uh, you can find us at equaldignity.org. So our campaign uh, focuses on five specific areas. We have major discussions like this one and uh, we would love for you to join that conversation. Up next, we have Art for Equal Dignity. Every Friday in July, we invite you to help us showcase the artist as a powerful facilitator of empathy and catalyst for global change with four simple steps. Uh, please check out our website for more information on these steps so that you can join Art for Equal Dignity and our Equal Dignity campaign. Um, check in on our weekly action checklist, again, at our website. And our upcoming programs are Art and Music as Resistance on July 31st at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, what Kids Need Right Now, July 29th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eviction, Crisis at the Core of Economic Instability, August 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Equitable Dinners, Lift Every Voice, August 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can find all of those events or those upcoming programs on our website. Um, and you can register for them just like you registered for this one. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you have friends or family or any colleagues that you know could really benefit from the information that our panelists shared with you today, please check out our Facebook, share our Facebook Live. Also, this video will be up on our website. Um, so please feel free to share. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, thank you so much to our panelists and to Tara for moderating. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Enjoy your Friday. Thank <laughs> you.